Jesus did live, die, and rise from the dead. So about a year or so ago, I thought, I need to write another book. I'd just written one about Islam. I debated a Muslim sheikh in Lagos, Nigeria, in front of about 800 people. About 600 of them were Muslims. And the debate's online if you're interested in it, by the way. And the topic was, is Jesus God? And Islam says he's not God. He's not the son of God. So we had that debate. And so I wrote a book from that called More Than a Prophet, The Identity of Jesus from the Bible, the Quran, and early sources. And by the way, uh, I have a new book out, which I'll talk about in a second, and we hope to have that printed in South Africa so you don't have to spend a fortune getting it from Amazon, and I guess it's not very cost-effective to do that in South Africa. We'll work on that. So I thought, what would be the most important thing to talk about? Well, what's the most important thing to us as believers? Did Jesus say and do what the Gospels say? Can we demonstrate or can we know historically that Jesus did say and do the things written in the Gospels? If he did, then he lived, died, and rose from the dead. And he's the Messiah. He is the Christ. If he didn't, if we can't make that case, we're going to have difficulty sharing what we believe with others. So I sat down and wrote a book called In Defense of the Gospels, which I have a couple of copies available. But, so this book came out in January. What I'm going to do now is to synthesize in just a few minutes... In fact, I remember in seminary, they teach you two things. Talk about God and talk about 30 minutes. So I'm going to do both. I'm going to synthesize and make the case as if you were in a courtroom and you're the judge, and can we demonstrate the Gospels are reliable? So that is going to be what we're going to talk about now, and that will be the distillation of, in essence, about, uh, oh, let's just say, 100 and some pages of this book. Here's an example of Adam reaching out to God, and if you look closely at this, it's almost as if you see Adam coming alive. (laughs) It's not really part of the painting. There's a cover of my book, The Gospels. Now, what are the Gospels? The Gospels is pretty simple. The book, the word gospel means good news. In Greek, it's News is angelos, or angel to announce. EU, the prefix, means good. Evangelism means preaching the good news. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, there are four what we call canonical gospels, the ones that have been accepted as authoritative. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the gospels, in essence, the nature of them are biographies. They're actually biographies of the central figure who is Jesus. Now, the Old Testament, the 39 books, will present and predict who the Messiah will be, the Gospels tell us Jesus proved to be the Messiah by the things he said and the things he did. But we talk about the Gospels as being controversial. Why should they be controversial? Well, first of all, they claim to present the truth about who God is. Today we're in an age in which people will say, truth, there is no such thing, or truth is what I feel or what I think. Truth is relative. No one lives their life that way, but today we're in this post modern age where people think there is no such thing as truth. And if someone says that, you just ask them, is that a true statement? God's plan for humanity. The Bible tells us, you know, if you look out at the, at the universe, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Romans chapter 2 says God has written his law in our hearts. But yet we're not told from our conscience or from the creation exactly what God requires of us other than to find out who he is and what he does want. And so the Bible says God has revealed his truth to us through the scriptures. Well, that's controversial. So God has spoken. Also, God's view of morality. Wow, things like family and marriage and sexuality, all the things that are being redefined in the last few years. Eternal consequences of unbelief. It's not popular today to have consequences attached to our actions. People want to escape the consequences. So that makes the Gospels controversial, plus the Gospels have stories involving miracles. Jesus performs many miracles. People today, quite often, following, unfortunately, that Scotsman, David Hume, thinking miracles, no, that's just uh, something that's fanciful. Plus, they provide a very narrow way to God. People today would like to have a nice broad path. Well, there is a broad path, Jesus said, but it leads to destruction. The path is narrow that leads to life, and few there are that follow that path. 
So the Gospels are controversial because they go against political correctness, that there is such a thing as truth, there are consequences to our actions, there is a God who has revealed himself and does miracles. So can the Gospels be trusted to tell us the truth? The truth about God, the truth about humanity, who we are, what God's intent is, the truth about Jesus himself, that it actually portrays in the way he was, truth about salvation, how we actually find a relationship with God that guarantees us eternal life through the promises of God, and then truth about the afterlife. Is there life after death? It's Job's famous question, Job 14, 14. If a man dies, will he live again? The Gospels tells us, yeah, you can live again, and you will live again one place or another, and that's why we find it controversial. But how do you test truth claims? Truth claims. I could claim your sins are forgiven, or I could claim I'm going to die for the sins of the world. The problem is there's no way to test a spiritual claim. If I say your sins are forgiven, how do you verify whether anything happens or not? Anybody could say that. So what we find in the scripture is such things like your sins are forgiven, I'm dying for your sins. Jesus used testable evidence to demonstrate that he did have support for his truth claims. His spiritual claims that cannot be directly tested could be tested by other things he did to confirm his ability in the spiritual realm. What do I mean? Case in point, the account in Matthew chapter 9 is also recorded in Luke chapter 5 and also Mark chapter 2. It's a famous story of the man who was paralyzed, and his friends brought him to Jesus in a little house in Capernaum. Well, they couldn't get inside because there was too large of a crowd, so they dropped him down through the roof. He's at Jesus' feet, and Jesus looks at the man and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Anybody could make the claim your sins are forgiven. So how do you know if it is true or not? And so those who were standing by were thinking, This man blasphemes. Who can forgive sin but God? Jesus, of course, knowing their thoughts, says, Okay, what would be easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven? That's pretty easy to say. Or to a paralyzed man, rise up and walk. It'd be easier to say your sins are forgiven, and then you don't know whether it happens or not. You can fake your way through it. So Jesus says, so that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, rise up and walk. Now, I'm not a poker player, but I understand in poker that's called going all in. He's, all his chips are on the table, and if this man does not rise up and walk, Jesus is a phony. He's a pretender. But when the man rises up and walks, it's evidence. It is verification. It's a testable miracle that confirms his special power to heal, which means it's only reasonable he can forgive sin. Same thing with the crucifixion. Uh, When Jesus says, I'm going to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world, You know what? It wasn't unusual for Jews to be crucified in the first century. The Romans took some pleasure in that because it was a deterrent against people uprising against the Roman Empire. So many Jews were crucified. Why was Jesus' crucifixion special? Because he said, I'm going to die for the sins of the world. Well, it's another spiritual claim. How do we know that he really did bear our sins? He said, I'm going to give you proof by rising from the dead. And so the resurrection of Jesus becomes the evidence, the proof that indeed he died for the sins of the world. So if the gospel accounts are reliable or we can test them, then in the spiritual claims, it only makes sense to believe the spiritual claims if the rest of the claims and the rest of the gospels are indeed reliable. So if it's accurate and reliable where it can be tested, it's not some great leap of faith to say it's reliable where it's not tested. Okay. So the question is this, do the Gospels provide a reliable account of Jesus' life and his teachings? Is this indeed what Jesus said and did? So are they reliable? And the question of reliability depends on the answers to six questions, and that's what we're going to cover really quickly this morning, these six questions. And these are the questions I deal with in the books. And the answer, if you answer these big six, you're going to be able to make the case for the Gospels. You're going to be able to demonstrate to any skeptic or to assure a believer why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are indeed reliable records of the life and teachings of Jesus. So let's make the case for the Gospels. You are the judge. 
First of all, when were they written, the dates? Were they written close enough in time to the events that these things could have been remembered, even without the help of the Holy Spirit? When in my book, I don't invoke the Holy Spirit. I just give you the facts and the history. Secondly, were these people actually there? Did they see these things, or were these tales that were handed down by word of mouth over generations and oral tradition so that it became confused and muddled. Third, were the writers biased so that we cannot accept what they say? They were followers of Jesus, so certainly they must have had some bias, right? Can we accept them as being fair and honest? Number four, what about the lost gospels? Thank you, Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code for telling us that there were 80 Gospels at the time of Constantine in the 4th century, and only our four got in for various reasons. We'll address that, and you'll be able to answer this question if somebody asks you. Number five, here's the one that you commonly hear. Well, the Bible's been changed over the years. It does not say the same thing today as when it was originally written. It's been copied and recopied and so forth. Things taken out, things added. And lastly, Is it accurate? Can we confirm the events through history and archaeology? Do they confirm or do they call into question the things mentioned in the Gospels? So these are the big six. Answer these. You've made a case for the Gospels, an airtight case. And it's a cumulative case. You can actually bring all these together to make a total case. So let's talk about the dates. What's the time between the events and the writings? Now, First of all, we ask when the Gospels were written. Jesus died and rose from the dead around the year A.D. 30, 3-0, the year A.D. 30. Now, some scholars say 28, some may say 31 or 32, but 30 is about the midpoint, so that's about the time we're working with. When, when were the Gospels written in relation to that? Secondly, are the events the type that you could remember, that they could recall them with some accuracy? And then lastly... How do the Gospels compare with other biographies, like the Gospels or biographies of Jesus, biographies of other figures at the same time? How do they compare in terms of the gap between when the events happened and the writings that took place? Okay, well, let's look at when scholars, and there's some disagreements, I'm going to give you the range. When do the people who study the Gospels, when do they believe they actually were written down? Now, there could have been written sources before these, but... This is, these are the primary dates as to when they were written. The Gospel of Mark, probably around AD 40 at the earliest. There's even one liberal scholar who believes that, as late as AD 75. So that's from 10 to 45 years after Jesus. Gospel of Matthew, earliest around AD 50, which would be about 20 years after Jesus, as late as 80 if you're liberal. 20 to 50 years, Luke, up to uh, 25 to 55 years, and John, most people would say John wrote last, from somewhere from 60 to A.D. 95. Uh, we do have early church historians who say that John lived to the end of the first century, so he certainly was around by A.D. 95, whether he wrote then or not. Okay, so that's when scholars essentially say this happened. Jesus wrote A.D. 30, so we're talking anywhere from Mark 10 years, the conservative view, up to John 65 years, if you take the critical view. Can the events be accurately remembered from 20 to 65 years after the events? So that's the first question. Written close enough in time they could be remembered. So let's talk about memories. Memories. Studies have shown that the more emotional an event and the more unusual the event, the easier it is for for us to remember the event. And it's almost as if there's a snapshot in your mind where you can almost take a picture of that event. Case in point, in my country, uh, September 11, 2001, the trade towers were attacked by terrorists, and we had 3,000 people die. 1990, this is 28 years ago, Mandela freed from prison. And in my country, our president was assassinated November 22, 1963. Now, those who were alive during these events, you probably remember where you were when you first heard about it. The World Trade Center was 17 years ago. I can remember where I was when I first found out about the attack on the trade centers. 
Were you, where were you when you heard that Mandela had been freed? It was a huge event in South Africa, of course, especially even in this area where he hails from. And then uh, I was alive when President Kennedy was assassinated. I remember exactly how I found out exactly what I was doing on that date. That was 55 years ago. So you see that some events you can remember with clarity because of the nature of the event. So would the disciples forget about something like Lazarus being raised from the dead? Oh, let's see, now what happened there? Doesn't happen every day, or someone walking on water, or Jesus himself dying on a cross and rising from the dead. Not things you would typically forget. So there's a good chance that the gospel material was accurately remembered, even without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, though, the Gospel of John says Jesus was telling the disciples in the upper room, I'll bring these things to your remembrance. So I believe there was actually some help by the Holy Spirit, but to a skeptic or a secular person, I don't even use the inspiration or the Holy Spirit. I just talk about the types of events themselves to make that case. Okay. Long-term memories. How many here are married? Okay. Do you remember the proposal? Of course you do. And how many who have children remember when your first child was born? Indeed, yes, I see the hands go up. In Simon's case, he's up to five. I'm thinking he's working on rugby seven, uh, or baseball had, takes nine in America. Uh, so I'm not sure if, you, if that's a prophecy or not, Simon, but uh, Simon's up to five. So here's right, was this right before or after I proposed? Right after I proposed to Lori. Now, guys who are, how many guys are single here? Single guys, I'm going to give you an example. Some are admitting it. Just one possible technique, if you find that special lady, here's what I did. I thought, how could I increase my odds of her saying yes? So I went with a group to China, 10,000 miles away from America in a communist country, took her up on the Great Wall of China and told her she was the eighth wonder of the world. And she (laughs) fell for it. Okay, so now let's compare the Gospels to other ancient biographies. Now remember, the Gospels are written from within 10 to even up to 65 years after. Do I go this way? I'll go this way. So let's say here's ground zero. Here's AD 30. Here's when Jesus died and rose from the dead. AD 30. I'll go down here. Now, if we take 10 years for Mark, earliest, all the way up to about 65 years for John. So there's the gap between the time Jesus died and when the Gospels were written. That's the range. Now let's compare that to ancient biographies. Let's take Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, uh, he lived about 330 BC. Now if we take when Alexander the Great lived, 330 BC, here's ground zero for Alexander. When were the biographies written about his life that we rely on today? Not 10, not 65, not 100, not 150, not 200, not 300, but over 400 years after Alexander lived, Arian and Plutarch, the two biographies we rely on today to learn about Alexander the Great. So when you compare the Gospels to other ancient biographies, what we have are written so close to the events that there's hardly any comparison when you look at other types of biographies of the ancient world. So to answer the first question, were the Gospels written at a time close enough that they'd be accurately remembered? Yes. 10 to 65 years at the longest by eyewitnesses when hostile witnesses were still alive. Events are the type easily remembered and written much closer to the events than any other historical uh, biographies were. So, one were the Gospels written, close enough that they would have remembered this stuff. Number two, well, who wrote the Gospels? The New Testament says, first of all, Luke tells us he was an investigative journalist. Luke chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And he says, I wanted to investigate these things carefully that I might lay these things out for you in consecutive order. So Luke, not being an eyewitness, interviewed the eyewitnesses to give us his account. John chapter 21 talks about the author, the writer of John, telling us an eyewitness account. And then John tells us in the gospel, in the first John chapter 1, he says, these things we've seen with our eyes, we've heard with our ears, we've touched with our hands. We declare these things to you. So these were eyewitness accounts. And you have Peter, the gospel of Mark being attributed to actually Peter. I'll get more of that in a moment. 
But Peter says, we have not clev followed cleverly devised fables, but we were eyewitnesses. So the claim is the gospel's written by eyewitnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Although Mark's gospel actually being a recollections of Peter and Luke's gospel being his investigative journalism. Now, outside of the Bible, here's what we have from early church writers. Papias was the Bishop of Hierapolis, writing around the year AD 120. He was a actual disciple of John. He lived to hear John preach, and he was a hearer of John, according to the church historian Eusebius. What did Papias say? He said that Matthew recorded his sayings in the Hebrew language. So we know from him that Matthew wrote a gospel. He says in Hebrew, we presume he means Aramaic. We don't have any Aramaic copies today. We have Greek copies, but at least he pins on Matthew having written the gospel. And he also tells us Mark was a companion of Peter and that Mark wrote down the things that Peter told him. So the gospel of Mark would really be the recollections of Peter as given to John Mark. So there we have it. Matthew wrote Matthew. Mark wrote Mark. And then you have Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, Lugdunum back then. Now it's Lyon in France. And he said that Luke set down the book of the gospel preached by his teacher and that John the disciple uh, also wrote a gospel living in Ephesus. So here about the middle toward the end of the second century, you have outside the New Testament confirmation of who wrote the gospels. There are no traditions of anyone other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John writing these four books. None. So the best evidence of who wrote these? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So here's the startling conclusion. So what did you learn today? You went to hear this professor from America. What did he tell you? He told us Matthew was written by Matthew, Mark by Mark, Luke by Luke, and John by John. But well, we gave you the reasons for this. But this is based on external corroboration in addition. Now, some people today, by the way, will say, and I, I deal with this in my book, the, the Gospels are anonymous, meaning we don't know who wrote them. Well, that, of course, we just demonstrated that's not the case. What they're saying is, internally, if you read the Gospels, it doesn't do what Paul does in his letters. Have you noticed in Paul's letters, he'll say, Paul the Apostle of the church at Philippi, or Paul the Apostle. So he, he tells you he's writing it. The Gospels don't tell you. They just jump right in and start telling the story about Jesus. So did the earliest copies have a heading that says Gospel of Matthew or Gospel according to Mark? Well, we don't have the originals. But the oldest copies we have, every single one that has the beginning of a gospel has one of those names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. There are no copies of anonymous gospels. So they're internally anonymous in that sense, but we absolutely know who wrote them from tradition and from internal evidence that whoever wrote Luke, for example, also wrote the book of Acts. Okay, no surviving traditions of anybody else. So we've got... The Gospels written close enough in time to be remembered by their traditional writers. Question now, were they biased? Oh, how can we believe these people? Because these people were followers of Jesus. That would be like asking people right in here, do you like Jesus? Yeah, of course we do. So they basically slanted the stories. That's the accusation. Well, how do you answer that? That is the common objection. They were converts. So what we're reading is filtered through the lens of belief. Ah, how do you know if they're being honest or not? There is a criterion. And this criterion is interesting because it was developed by a very liberal Christian, or I'll just say a liberal scholar. I'm not even sure he's a Christian. There's this group of people called the Jesus Seminar. The Jesus Seminar, a self-appointed group of liberals, and by liberals I mean people who have a very low view of the inspiration of the Bible. And they sat around and they vote on whether or not the words attributed to Jesus in the Gospels are actually written by Jesus, or actually spoken by Jesus. And they conclude may 18 to 20 percent is actually authentic from Jesus. The rest was added later. One of the co-founders of the Jesus Seminar is named Robert Funk. And Robert Funk came up with this criterion. How do you know if a historical work is biased or is honest? And it is the criterion of embarrassment. What is the criterion of embarrassment? If you include in your biography things that make, the, let's say in this case, the disciples and Jesus look bad, 
That's evidence they're being honest. They don't just tell us the good, they tell us everything. So for example, if you were just making up the stories in the Gospels, would you include the accounts of the disciples after being told to watch and pray, falling asleep? No, you don't put that in. No, we were staying awake, we were ready to fight Rome for Jesus. Would you include the disciples often misunderstanding Jesus? No, you wouldn't do that. Would you include, and by the way, guys especially, we pride ourselves on wanting to be strong and brave. Well, who is at the cross of Christ? One man, John, and three ladies. Now, where I come from, we have this idea of being tough, brave, macho is the word. You don't make this stuff up. If you're going to make up a fanciful account of the crucifixion, why those disciples are being held back, and they were all trying to go up and rescue Jesus. No, you don't have that. They're scattered. They're afraid. Peter denies Jesus three times. This is not the type of stuff you put as fiction. This is the type of stuff you only put in if it's true. The criterion of embarrassment. That's what we see. The disciples are told on many occasions they had little faith. And even Jesus, he doesn't know the day or hour he's coming back. When I debated the Muslim sheikh in Lagos a year and a half ago, he would bring up things like this to demonstrate why Jesus is not God, which, of course, we can explain because Jesus was both God and man. Jesus in his humanity. The Bible says cursed is those are those who hang on a tree. Jesus is crucified. But yet the Bible tells it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the answer to question three, were the gospel writers biased? Absolutely not, because the criteria of embarrassment shows we're told the entire story, both the good and the bad. Unvarnished truth. Number four. Okay. What about like the Da Vinci Code that says there were something like 80 Gospels, and what we have today are just the four that the politicians in the early church thought these will support our point of view. Dan Brown says more than 80 Gospels were considered, very few went in. Why only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? What about the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, etc., etc.? So all these different Gospels. What really are the lost Gospels? Now, you have a serial here in South Africa, similar to what I had in New Zealand 30 years ago, called Wheatbix or Weetabix. We have something similar in America, kind of similar. It's called Grape Nuts. Anybody ever had Grape Nuts? Now, one thing that's interesting about Grape Nuts is they are neither grapes nor are they nuts. So that's the name of the cereal. The lost Gospels are neither lost nor are they Gospels. The Gospel of Thomas, for example. All of these so-called lost Gospels, they have some common denominators. One is the earliest they were written was about 120 years after the time of Jesus. That's the earliest. Most of them written 300 years after Jesus, of course, not by eyewitnesses, also being forgeries writing in the name of someone like Thomas, and it's not Thomas writing it. But here's an example of Thomas the forgery written 150 years after Jesus. This is one of the earliest of these so-called lost Gospels. Most of these were discovered at the end of the 19th century and middle of the 20th century in Egypt in garbage dumps. There's a reason for that, because they were discarded. They were actually the fanciful work of a cult called Gnosticism. So that's what we really find from these. But these... Uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, you have these sayings attributed to Jesus. Let me give you an example of one of these sayings. Church historian Eusebius calls them the fiction of heretics. Simon Peter says to Jesus, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. Every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, right. Not something you'd find in the Gospels. Now, there's another account on one of these fanciful Gospels, actually it's the Acts of Paul and Thecla, where Paul runs into a lion walking along a road, and the lion, Paul figures, figures I'm supposed to suffer many things for Jesus, and the uh, lion, instead of attacking him, starts talking to him and asks, what must I do to be saved? So kind of parodying what happens in Acts 16 with the Philippian jailer. Well, Paul never witnessed to a lion, so he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And the lion says, okay, I do. Will you baptize me? And so 
Paul never baptized a lion, but he figured, why not? So in this fanciful gospel, he baptizes the lion. Later on, Paul's in Ephesus. And if you know the story from uh, 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 the, when Paul's in Ephesus, he, they're destroying all their idols, so they bring Paul into the arena. They're chanting against him, and they decide he should die. So they throw him into the middle of the arena, and they let a hungry lion in to devour him. But it's the same lion he had witnessed to and baptized earlier, so they recognize each other and embrace and walk out arm and paw. Uh, men and women, these do not rise to the level of the Gospels. These are the fanciful accounts, and in some cases, a substitute for the salacious novels of the second century, pious fiction written by Christians for Christians rather than having them reading the salacious stuff. So were there any books left out of the New Testament? Raymond Brown says, we learn not a single verifiable new fact about the historical ministry of Jesus from these events. There were no gospels left out. So the answer is, no, we have what we need. Number five, we hear this a lot. So have the Gospels been changed over the years? The answer is no. But people think it's like the telephone game. Whisper a phrase to someone, and as it goes around the room, by the time it reaches the other end, it's totally distorted. But that's not how the Gospels came to us. They are originally written, even though the autographs are missing, we do rely on later copies. We don't have the originals, but we don't have the originals of virtually any writings of antiquity. So there's two facts to determine how reliable. One is, well, how old are your copies? Are they close enough to when they were written that they didn't go through generations of copying? Number two, do you have a lot of copies to examine? The more you have, the better. So I like to do, call this the manuscript comparison factor, comparing New Testament documents to other works of antiquity. If you stack all the copies up of all the different authors of antiquity, the tallest pile of any author would be about four feet high. That's it. Of every museum in the world, until the printing press, about four feet high, what is that, a meter and a half, roughly? I don't do metrics, so I have to think about doing the, going from yards to feet and all this, but I think if Jesus had wanted us to be on the metric system, he would have had 10 disciples, so I think we're okay doing it the way I do it, amen? So that'd be 10 feet. How tall would the pile be if we piled up all the New Testament manuscripts? Would it be taller than four feet? Yeah, it would actually be taller than the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It would be over a mile high. So when we talk about comparison, how much evidence we have to examine to reconstruct the New Testament text and the Gospels, it's, there's no close second. So it's really, a, uh, it, it's, it's really not even close. So here's an example of when these other ancient documents were written that were contemporaries of the Gospels. And you see, when you look at Caesar... Written 50 B.C., there's like 900 years between when he wrote and our oldest existing copy. The New Testament, we have a fragment from 25 to 35 years after John wrote his gospel, assuming he wrote in A.D. 90 or thereabouts. So you see that anybody who says the Bible's been changed over the years would have to get rid of all of antiquity. Now, what about William Shakespeare? Shakespeare's barely 400 years old. His last work was The Tempest, written around 1610. Now, Shakespeare wrote about how many plays? Who knows how many plays Shakespeare wrote, Rob? Say 37. Good, I, what a great, 37, that's right. 37 plays. Of those 37 plays, how many do we have the original copies, right off the pen of Shakespeare? The answer, and it's only 400 years, is zero, none. Of those 37 Shakespeare plays, how many of them have gaps? The fancy word is lacuna. Gaps, where to be or... What did he say there? The answer is all 37 have gaps. And so there's a huge body of literature, textual criticism of Shakespeare to determine what he actually wrote since we don't have the originals and the copies differ and there are big gaps. When it comes to the New Testament, it comes to the Gospels, no gaps. So the answer to question number five, is the wording of our Gospels the same as original? Yes. The evidence, textual criticism says yes. Many, many more copies of the Gospels, much closer to the time they are originally written, much more reliable than the text of Shakespeare from just 400 years ago. And then last, does history and archaeology actually support the things that we find in the Scriptures? And I'll only give an example or two, but some Gospel accounts are challenged by skeptics. Did Pilate really exist? And it wasn't until the 1960s that we actually discovered a monument, a, a fragment 
of a monument in Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea on the coast of Israel, that actually confirms Pontius Pilate, and it's a plaque to him. Uh, there's also the question of the use of nails at crucifixion. Some skeptics would say we've never found that the Romans used nails in crucifixion in the first century. So therefore, the gospel accounts that talk about, see the nail prints, must have been made up. And so skeptics would use that as an accusation. Then it was in about 1968. They were excavating to build a shopping center in Jerusalem. And they came across what's called an ossuary. And it's really a, 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 a huge container of bones. And people would put their bones in these. It's like a casket. And they looked on the outside, and there was a name of the person inside. It was written, Yochanan ben Hagagal. Yochanan ben Hagagal, son of Hagagal. And they opened it up, popped the lid, and they saw something in there other than his bones that was unique. He'd been crucified in the first century. How did they know? A big spike was sticking out of his heel bone. It was bent, and they couldn't get it out, so they just left it in. So there was evidence, not until 1968, that nails were used in crucifixion in the first century. So archaeology and history are a friend of the gospel. It keeps supporting the testimony that we find from 2,000 years ago. The existence of Nazareth wasn't until about 1990s, actually about the year 2000, confirmed that there was a town there contemporary to the time of Jesus. And then I have many quotes from archaeologists who will say that there's no archaeological finding that has ever that's been properly confirmed, that's refuted any type of biblical teaching. Uh, Nelson Gleck, Jewish archaeologist, said, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. That's from his book, History of the Negev, Rivers in the Desert, page 31, near the bottom. I can see it. I use that quote. And Colin Hemer, who shows that there are over 80 separate accounts in the book of Acts, to show Luke's reliability that have been confirmed by archaeology. The people, the names, the, the figures, uh, the titles that were given, all these things confirming that. So the answer to question six, do archaeology and history confirm the gospel of reliability? The answer is yes, they do, based on the places, titles, terms, events. So let's do the summation. So before a verdict, and a verdict means to say the truth in a courtroom, before you give the verdict and you're the judge, let's do our summation. The Gospels can be trusted to tell us the truth because, number one, they're written close enough to the events. Number two, written by eyewitnesses and primary sources. Number three, without bias, with earmarks of honesty, criterion of embarrassment. Number four, none have been lost. Number five, the wording has not changed over the years. Number six, accuracy was confirmed by history and archaeology. And... In addition to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because the title of this message they gave me was, Did Jesus Really Exist? Is He a Historical Person? Well, in addition to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are there any other historical sources that confirm his historicity? And the answer is yes. And here's a short list. Paul, Peter, James, Jude, Clement, Ignatius, Polycarp, Josephus, Tacitus, Pliny, Suetonius, Lucian, Marbarsalian, and Thelus. And the last five or six of these are secular historians and even people who doubted it. Therefore, in light of the evidence, the defense rests, the Gospels can be trusted as historical truth. Thank you.